I uh, just want to remind everybody about cell phones. If you please put those on quiet mode quick. Thank you. Uh, the media, we have three wireless mics. If you could just please let me know if you have a question. If you have a couple, kid, a couple of our students and Hank here, we'll get you the mics. I'll point uh, so you guys don't step on each other on any questions. Uh, just a reminder, it is a media event, so please keep the questions to the media today. Thank you. Uh, afterwards, uh, we'll have a couple of players available. Uh, David Morris and Jake Luton will be available in the Players' Lounge, which is right down the hall here, so if any media want to chat with those two uh, student athletes, more than welcome to. And one other thing, media, please introduce yourselves uh, first time you have the mic so we can kind of put a name, face, that sort of thing. So with that, I'd like to introduce Vice President of Oregon State University and Director of Athletics, Scott Barnes. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a pep rally to ske uh, scheduled for today. I just didn't know it was going to be during the uh, press conference. Uh, so with that, is it a great day to be a beaver? Absolutely. Let me thank a few people who were so helpful along the way uh, in this journey. Certainly, uh, and you'll hear from him momentarily, our president, Ed Ray, for his sage advice along the way and support. Appreciate him. Dan Bartholomew, our Deputy Athletic Director and Sports Supervisor for Football, uh, along with us the whole way. Thank you for your support. And certainly J uh, DHR and Glenn Sugiyama for organizing uh, this uh, journey that we've been on over, over a period of time. Uh, also, um, as, as we went through the process, several former players and some coaches and some other colleagues uh, for their advice uh, and thoughts as we move forward and certainly can't forget about Beaver Nation and their outpouring of free advice <laughs> along the way. <laughs> a passionate, unbelievably passionate fan base we have and at times like this the care factor really shows and our, our Beaver Nation uh, did a wonderful job of showing how much they cared and ultimately supporting our decision. Let me talk to you just a bit about the process. As, uh, this was unique as, as we think back. What unfolded mid-season uh, put us in a really peculiar situation, but it also gave us an opportunity. And that opportunity was a chance to cast a much wider net than we might have normally cast uh, without a protracted uh, period of time. We were able to uh, assess the landscape uh, very quickly and uh, we're very pleased with the interest level of our position. We then moved on with access in mind. Those we were accessible to were coordinators first, and we were able to meet with them uh, fairly early on in the process, even during the season. This was a bit of a hurry up and wait process because although our offensive and defensive coordinators around were accessible, sitting head coaches were not. So after, uh, after interviewing coordinators, we continued to evaluate the landscape and assess the landscape and then commenced as soon as the final game was played uh, this past weekend, Saturday and Sunday. We, we started again in earnest. <clears throat> Let me tell you that one of the first individuals we interviewed in the process was Jonathan Smith. And from that point in time, Jonathan Smith became the benchmark for which we would compare others to. Uh, at, in the end, Tuesday night, we came back and sat with Jonathan for two reasons. One was to reaffirm what we already knew and to have a little deeper conversation in various uh, areas and ultimately offering him the position. That was an emotional time for Jonathan and myself. And when you think about Jonathan and you get to know him, the things you'll learn about him is that he has a, a, a bit of a tenacity to him. He is uh, incredibly authentic. He's got grit. He's got unparalleled passion for this place. As I spoke to our student athletes and introduced Jonathan this morning, the one thing I told them was that understand who is before you. This is a man that won a championship, a conference championship here. He knows how to do it, and he knows how to do it the right way. 
The qualities we're looking for in a coach included the base, incredible integrity and high ethical standards, an incredible motor, uh, and, and those things were very apparent. And as you think about those that Jonathan has worked for, the incredible pedigree that he has, having been tutored, tutored by the likes of Coach Peterson, Erickson, Riley, and others, uh, the pedigree is something that we were very impressed with. Why? Because in the end, that pedigree has grown a young, heralded football player from Oregon State into one of the top offensive coordinators and young head coaches in America. And with that, I can tell you I am unbelievably excited about the next chapter in Beaver football history. And with that, let me introduce to you, for a few more words, our president, Ed Ray. Those of you who know me know that it's not coincidentally that people typically introduce me by inviting me to add a few more words. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Good morning. I want to welcome uh, Candace and Robert and Bella and Charlie. I think we have a few uh, potential scene stealers here, so you'll want to keep a close eye on them as well. They're wonderful, wonderful young people. This is just an incredible uh, uh, day for all of Beaver Nation. Uh, Scott talked about my sage advice. I think if you probe that, you would find out that um, one of my greatest contributions is, like most uh, couch potatoes, to keep my sage advice to myself and let the people who know what they're doing do, do their job. I'm very excited for all of us, for uh, OSU football, for Beaver Nation, our athletics program, the university, this is just a great day for all of us. I think uh, it's obvious to us, all of us who've been involved in this process that we found the perfect person at the perfect moment uh, to be coach here at Oregon State University. Uh, Jonathan's a proven uh, winner. He, uh, for those who doubt it, you need to look back uh, only at the Fiesta Bowl in 2001 when uh, the Beavers prevailed over Notre Dame, 41 to nine, and Jonathan was named the offensive uh, MVP. You know, I'm conflicted sometimes about the value of words as an academic. I believe that words do matter, but as an administrator and someone who has to get things done, I also understand that talk is cheap. You gotta produce results, and Jonathan is, uh, proven in the past that he can deliver results. I think he can connect with the players and all of Beaver Nation, but he knows what it takes to get to the very pinnacle of success in uh, college football, and I think he's got the vision and the capability uh, to help us to get back there. In other contexts, we talk about the fact that our graduates are the most important contribution we make to the future. It is not acceptable to be mediocre in the classroom. It is not acceptable to be mediocre on the field of competition. We strive for excellence in everything we do. And we need to be real with ourselves. Look at where we are, what do we expect going forward? What I expect us to move to very quickly is an understanding by anyone who comes here to compete with us to appreciate this is our house. And I've said it before, if you come here and don't bring your A game, we're going to hand your butt to you. And we have someone who knows how to do that. So I'm very excited that we have Jonathan here. I know it's uh, wonderful for him to have this opportunity to come back. And uh, we're all going to be in there helping in any way we can. And, and watching uh, some wonderful uh, change occur in, in this program. You've seen it elsewhere in our athletics program. We have a number of uh, teams that are doing wonderfully and have in, in the recent past, and we need to get back there with respect to uh, football as well. Now, as much as I know you really like listening to me, let me introduce the coach of Oregon State University football, Jonathan Smith. And before I let uh, Jonathan uh, share his observations with you, we have a little ceremonial moment here. Don't worry, you don't have to put the helmet on.
Well, it is great to be home. You know, it is an honor to be the head football coach at a university that I care so deeply about. It is an honor to be here standing in front of you. This past 24 hours is really, it, it has reaffirmed to me why I got into this profession. The outpour of text and calls from former teammates and players and people of this Beaver Nation and community of Corvallis and the state of Oregon, it reminded me of all these relationships that have been built now 20 years ago in this town. And I remember when I was in this town, it, it would began to say you know, I wanted to be a football coach because some of the experiences I was having as a player, I wanted to continue that as a football coach. Some of the relationships that I built through playing football at a university like this is really why I wanted to do that. And so the outpouring of texts and, uh, and calls and re reconnecting with some of them, I couldn't get back to all of them. It just reaffirmed to me why I wanted to do this. And now I'm sitting here in front of you guys at my dream job, in my dream town, at my dream school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to do some thank yous, especially starting with these guys next to me, President Ray, Scott Barnes, Dan, Glenn Sugiyama. Uh, you guys have been phenomenal through this process. I thought the whole thing was first class. These guys came and did meet with me early in this process and then allowed me to finish my job at where I was, and I appreciated that. I could stay focused on that. They kept me abreast of where it was at, but it wasn't overwhelming in any way, a distraction. These guys were first class, top notch, and I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for that. I do want to thank my family sitting down here. Candace, my wife, been married for 15 years. We talked about this day coming. And our first two years of that marriage was sitting right here in Corvallis as a graduate assistant, so she's coming home as well. My son, Robert, Bella, Charles, climbing all over the place. Appreciate you guys. My mom has been able to make it here today. And how about that? Today's her birthday, hey. November 3rd day. When I, when I first did this list and started wanting to think about all the people I had to thank, it was just going to be impossible. All the people in this town and have been impactful on me throughout my lifetime. But uh, I'd be remiss about mentioning a few of these, and so I want to I thank some other people. It's going to start with Chris Peterson. Six years together, gave me an opportunity at Boise State, brought me over to the University of Washington, really teached, teached me how to build a championship team, and it started with building a championship culture. The guy is elite teacher, elite football coach. I will always be indebted to that man. My growth as a coach and as a teacher and as a friend and as a human being is all so much better from my time spent with him. He means the world to me. Nick Holt gave me my first opportunity as a full-time job at the University of Idaho. And uh, I'll, be, I'll always be indebted to him for that. Robin Flugrad gave me my first opportunity to be an offensive coordinator at the University of Montana. Took a shot at a guy, and those jobs are not easy to get to be hired as a coordinator when you had not done it. He, uh, he believed in me, gave me opportunity. I'll always be grateful for him. Mark Vott was a good friend of mine, went to this school, always been a mentor and an encourager. And uh, his advice through tough times meant, meant so much to me. Mitch Barnhart. Athletic director back in the day when I was here and has continued that relationship throughout. Great advisor, someone I lent on and continue to lean on. I appreciate him. And then, of course, my last two of uh, my coaches, right, my coaches. I'm going to start with Mike Riley because he, he, he's the one who gave me this opportunity. Vividly remember it with Mike Riley. Came up here on a recruiting visit. and He said, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to walk on but you'll be treated just like a scholarship player. You'll get opportunities just like a scholarship player in regards to competing. He kept his word, and uh, history, history played out. Uh, he, he really laid the foundation for my understanding of football knowledge, schematics, and uh, how you evaluate talent and use talent. I'll always be indebted to him. Such a good man, a dear friend to this day. And then Dennis Erickson, right? Dennis Erickson, some of the... Best years of my life here as well of, of winning games. Dennis Erickson really taught me what it's about to be a true competitor. And you're not going to back down to anyone or any program in any way. You're going to go out and compete. And there's, I can vividly remember, and I told the guys just a minute ago, he walks into a room 
right? We had just, Mike Riley goes to the Chargers. He walks into that first team meeting room. He starts flashing around a national championship ring and says, why not here? Why not? We can get this done right here. And that was an echoed message to these guys that I met with at 10 o'clock. So those guys have been crucial to my development. Mike Riley and Dennis and Erickson have been uh, phenomenal, dear friends. And I learned so much from those guys and I continue will to do so. OSU fits me and I fit OSU. In regards to the town, the place to where raise some kids, the place to go to school, and again, beyond just being a student athlete, be involved in a community. The state of Oregon fits me. I've been in the Northwest for now 15 some odd years. This is a great place. I always travel back here and I'm so excited to start to raise a family at this place and turn a football program into something special. OSU is a, a spot that's dear to my heart and I don't, I don't hold it lightly to stand in front of you and more or less the front porch of the university in one of the biggest jobs in the state of Oregon, especially at this place. It is an honor to sit here and be able to represent this university in a way of integrity with accountability and, uh, and competitiveness because that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go out and compete. We're gonna do it the right way. We can establish a, a culture where these kids, their school is important to them. School is gonna be a part of their lives throughout but also we're gonna go out and compete and win some football games because that's really why I'm here. And so again, this place fits me. I know how to sell this place in regards to recruiting. Very confident when I go in and sit in a room with a mom or a prospective student athlete, I can genuinely tell them what it is like and how it, does, how it looks to get it done because I've done it and it can get done again. And I've lived it and I've walked those dorm room halls and I've gone to class on campus and I've worked out in this uh, building it's been done and it can be done again. I think there's sometimes the slogans sound really cool and recruiting pitches can be really artful and we'll have some of those. But when you look in my eye and see what, how it means to me, I believe I can sell this place. And at the end of the day, it can continue to sell itself the more people continue to look into it. And so I feel very confident on the recruiting end. The other piece on the recruiting end for it, I'm from Southern California. Uh, that's gonna be a heavy base of recruiting. I've been in this conference for the last four years. I know what it looks like to transition, change a culture, and win a championship as a coach, and obviously as a player. Very confident I've got what it takes, a vision for what it needs to look like. I've lived it, I've coached it, and now we need to go get it done. Now we need to go get it done. So honored to be here, so excited. And again, this place fits me, this is home to me, and let's go Beavs. three of you, for, oh, Lindsay Schnell, USA Today, sorry. Uh, first, Scott and Ed, you know, what was it about his interview that impressed you so much? I'm guessing it was super detailed. And then, Jonathan, can you speak to how you prepared for that interview? You had, you said, dream job, like, even though you brushed aside questions when that opening first came up when you were up in Seattle, were you thinking in the back of your head, I'm gonna be ready to crush this? So in terms of the interview, it didn't hurt that Jonathan vividly provided a scenario about walking into a recruit's home with a polished Pac-10 championship ring on and a recipe how to get there again. That didn't hurt him a bit. Let's, uh, let's back up a little bit. I didn't know Jonathan Smith. I knew the legend. I knew uh, that Jonathan, I knew the record of, of uh, him being one of the most decorated players that we've ever had in our history. But I didn't know Jonathan, so I was anxious to learn about him and to see him eye to eye. And one of the first things that struck me was uh, a coach that had a, an authenticity and a grit to him that fit this place so well. Now, you think about all the things that go into selecting a head coach, and Jonathan is, is listed several, I've listed several. Um, but it starts with the person and the leadership capacity, and I was so impressed with his passion, um, his conviction for Oregon State and what could be done, uh, his plan, uh, but it starts with the man, and uh, that was, I was very impressed. 
Yeah, I guess if I could add something quickly, it would be, uh, if you think about it, part of what I heard about uh, Jonathan because I came here after uh, Jonathan had left was that among his uh, distinctive qualities, uh, he had a certain degree of autonomy as a quarterback has to have on the playing field. And he didn't make mistakes. He made really good judgments in the moment. So he had a certain degree of autonomy. He took it and he was accountable for making uh, difficult decisions. And as an offensive coordinator with Chris Peterson, I think he's had some of that same autonomy and ability to uh, make decisions. And obviously, he made very good decisions. So I think it's critical that we have a coach who knows how to make uh, uh, solid decisions, wants the responsibility for making hard decisions, and is willing to hold himself and others accountable for getting results. Because as I said earlier, uh, in some sense, talk can be cheap when you got a job to get done. This is a guy who I think can get a job done and, in fact, welcomes the opportunity to demonstrate that he can. I guess I, I, echoing a, your question there on my preparation for this and my outlining this plan, it was uh, it, it, it didn't mean a lot to me because it was so it wasn't hard to look at it. The uh, when we prepared, it was about the middle of the year. I can't remember the exact dates as we uh, we played this out. But I had a couple of days to put some outline and the vision of what I saw this place, the strengths and how we would sell and continue to recruit to this place. I also made mention of the current team as it was going on because I felt like the current team had opportunities and, and is not that far away. And I, I firmly believe that and I just told those guys that at 10 o'clock. And so preparing for this, I knew exactly what it needs to look like. I wanted to make it look like that and I don't think it's that far away. Jonathan, this is Ryan Thorburn with the Register Guard in Eugene. Um, obviously, when you were a player, Oregon and Oregon State were both playing at a high level um, last week. The Civil War was pretty lopsided. How much work do you have to do to catch up? And, and the second part to that, coming from Washington with what you guys built there and w with what Mike Leach has going on in, in Pullman, is there room for four really good teams in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, there's, there's work to get done, and there's work to – get done in really every place and to be able to sustain something like that. I do think that uh, this program is not that different than every program in this conference. I think this conference is the best conference in America and so the competitiveness of this conference week in and week out, and I think you saw that within some games, some teams rose up and, and won, where you gotta bring your A game week in and week out. So I just don't see the difference between all 12, 12 schools being that far, that far apart. I'm excited about the opportunity to get with these guys. I'll continue to learn more about them. There's no question everybody's got some work to get done, and I'm excited to do it. Are you wearing your Pac-10 championship right now? I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. um, these kids have been through a lot this year, yeah. and you yourself went through that type of transition, although this was an unconventional situation. What's your first priority in dealing with that? Yeah. I think any time a transition takes place, it's unsettling. It creates a, you know, a sense of chaos uh, and a sense of insecurity. We talked about it at 10 o'clock, and I think it's going to be vital is that we can begin to know these kids and to build some trust because these guys, again, have been recruited by different coaches. Some coaches have been up and out the door. Different things have taken place. we got to bring, bring some trust to the room because the culture really drives the behaviors of what's going to take place, and so trust is the foundation of that. And we'll do a lot of, a lot of work to, to gain that trust from these kids. Blondo Sanchez, KGW TV. Coach, uh, this has kind of been rock bottom for a lot of Beavers fans. What do you tell them after what has gone on this, this season and specifically last week? Yeah. You know, I think the circumstances of really last season and last week are, are very unique and very tough. And, and, and that's, that's the reality. Uh, I will say, I give credit to Corey Hall and how he uh, operated the first couple of games. It had those guys a new belief, a new fresh system, and you know, they were close. And that's why going off of what I see on tape, the thing is close. Again, you go through something as dramatic as what these kids did. It doesn't surprise me to have some up and ups and downs. But the reality, we need to bring in some, s some stability, and I, I, I bring that. <coughs> and with that st stability, I believe we can continue to progress. Jonathan Travis, I came to you on KBL and Eugene. Uh, Corey Hall um, brought, a, brought some stability in a really difficult time for this team, as you mentioned. 
Uh, have you had the chance to talk with him yet? And do you know if you plan on retaining him on your, on your coaching staff? Yeah, I have not had the opportunity to talk to him yet. I plan on doing that in the next day or two. I do, again, commend him for what, what he did in a, a very difficult situation. I've heard a lot of good things. I've never had the chance to meet him, and so I look forward to doing that. I guess we're on. Jonathan, Nick Krepke from Fox 12 in Portland. I know you were in the thick of it with the Huskies this year, but when, when Gary left, it shocked seemingly everybody. As an alum, how did that affect you? And maybe you did since that point, you think, boy, I hope they maybe reach out to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was very surprised with Gary. I've met Gary a couple of times and think uh, very highly of him. So when that did take place, it did cross my mind as may maybe this is time. Maybe this is the time to do this and, uh, and go after it. Um, again, with the way the search was, was dealt or held, uh, I was able to function and continue to stay focused, but it was in the back of my mind for a long time. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Brendan Slaughter, BeaversEdge.com. Uh, just when Beaver fans think of the name Jonathan Smith, obviously it's the Fiesta Bowl, the, that great season. What is kind of your plan, and what makes you think you can kind of bring those moments back to Oregon State and back to the level of success when you were here as a player? Right. You know, I, I, as a player, I, we had a, a mix of personalities in the locker room, and I think we can continue to do that. I think this place is unique in regards to where you can draw your players from. It all comes back to the, the culture that was created there at the time. And that's for the guys in the building so far. We're going to add a few. And so it's going to start with that. And that's how you get things started is create a culture of excellence. And that's what we're doing from day one. Jonathan, Danny Moran with the Oregonian. As far as putting together a staff, what's your time frame? You mentioned you haven't spoken with Corey Hall yet. When do you hope to have your full staff established? Right. We're in the process of that, and we're definitely we've been talking to some different people. The, you'll be hearing some names here in the next next few days, but I'm not going to put an exact timetable on on anything. The big piece on who we hire is a man of a character, of integrity. You know, I kind of describe it as low ego, high output. That's what I'm looking for. The guys that with low ego, ready to come in here and have some compassion and work with our kids, held to accountability, but also obviously got to got to deliver. And you said. The team is not that far away. Where are you not that far away from, and, and how soon do you think you can get to? Well, yeah, I, I just from one side of the ball, obviously, we've game planned that defense, and there are some good players that are running around and doing some good things. You know, that we've got a couple bad breaks. We've had some injuries on that end. I don't see that side of the ball that, that far away. There's some good players on offense. This, you know, the running back was good. Had the injury to the quarterback, and so there's some things that created some issues. And then with the coaching change, it just was a you know, a, a sur unsurmountable um, situation. Jamie Schwartz, Beaver Blitz. How soon will you get out on the road and get those recruits back committed and things like that? Yeah, we're looking to do that. Uh, at the earliest, it'd be Sunday, but Monday for, for sure to be out on the road because there are, there are some players that are committed. There are some players that have some drawn some interest here in the last 24 hours, and so we hope to, to get out on the road at least by Monday. Angie Machado, Beaver Blitz. Um, Beaver fans are obviously with you coming back home. There's talk of several other former players, teammates of yours that are in doing well in the coaching ranks. Any chance that we see a few more former Beavers? That's uh, that's for sure a consideration, you know, as you, and there's a, a bunch of guys out there doing really, really well. And I think there's a bunch of guys out there doing really, really well because they started their foundation at this place and the uh, the things they learned and experienced <laughs> here, just like me. So, uh, yeah, there might be a, a guy or two that are part of it, and we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Haley Lewis, um, KUZI in Eugene. A lot of players or fans want to know exactly more, more of your personality, how you are as a coach. I know every coach has a slogan. So what type of coaching style do you have and how are you going to translate with those players and maybe yeah. a go-to slogan? Yeah, yeah, I don't got a go-to slogan at this point, but I will say I coach and I'm trying to be authentic because that's what I appreciated as a player. It's just, you know, being yourself. And I'll be saying my two college head coaches were authentic. They did it in drastically different ways. Their personalities were definitely different, but they were authentic. So that's my, that's my style. Jonathan, Dan Utsman from the All-American. How's it going? Good. Uh, at what point in your career did you know that you wanted to be the coach at Oregon State? And at what point did you think that was possible? Right. You know, I always, uh, I, I always wanted to come back to Oregon State. I didn't always think about being the head coach because there's a lot of things that came with it. I will say as I continue to be in this profession, 
um, the, the thought of being a head coach at a place that really means so much to you, that began to grow on me. And then being in this conference the last four years as an offensive coordinator and you know having a pretty close eye on what was taking place at Oregon State, I started to envision being the, you know, the, the head coach here, and, and that's really when I, I was ready to do it. What was your conversations with Chris over the past week, 36 hours, 24 hours? Yeah, he, he was unbelievable through this whole, he was, he was well aware of what, what was taking place. Um, he's very supportive, and he gave me some good wisdom in regards to things to consider as I was considered in this. And so he's been, he's been awesome, was supportive, and all the way to, to, the, to the end here, last 20, 24 hours. Coach, AJ McCord with Coin6 in Portland. As you're kind of getting into the thick of recruiting, what are some of the biggest selling points you're going to be talking to these recruits about, especially outside the state of Oregon? Right. You know, I think it, you, you sell the place and the people of this place, for sure, in regards to the uh, authenticity of this place, people that, uh, that means so much to them. You sell the college life that is unbelievable that I've experienced, the best college town in America, let alone the Pac-12 conference. And... Those are going to be starting points for me, for sure. I've lived it. I've been in it. Then again, we'll, we'll sell some of the offensive schemes that we'll be running, the defensive schemes that we'll be running, and, uh, and we're, we're excited. Uh, Ken, go with the Oregonian. Uh, you mentioned you're going to sell schemes. Can you tell us sort of where you're going to go with that? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, I can tell you in, in broad pictures, schemes are going to start with the players you got and the personnel you got. And so we're going to take a long look at what we have and what fits best. The type of guys we're going to hire on the offensive and defensive side will have a variety of background, and then we'll, we'll run from there. Can you just Have you got a chance to meet with any members of the team yet? And kind of what is that, if, if you have, what have uh, you kind of heard from them? And what's that experience been like just kind of talking to yeah. know them so far? I've met with the, the group here before we, we came in here at 10 o'clock. We had a team meeting, and it, it, was, it was really good. I, uh, we started about what this place means to me, told them all about that, told them my story, how I got here. And then we had some back and forth, and I asked them on where, what they thought of the place and what, what needs to be fixed and what's really good about the place. So that's the extent of what I've done with the players so far. And I'm obviously going to do some more moving forward. Scott, <clears throat> I noticed that on the press, comp the press release you guys put out that Pat Casey was quoted and talked about Jonathan. Um, I heard through the grapevine that you talked to Pat a lot about what he thought you guys needed in a football coach. And I just wondered as the single most successful coach here, like what he, what advice he gave you? <coughs> Appreciate the question. I, actually, when, when we brought the, our search firm in, Glenn in, I had him meet, I had him meet with Wayne Tinkle, Scott Rook, and Pat Casey individually. And I wanted to do that because I wanted nobody better to convey and articulate how special this place is and why, and how you can win and how you can be successful. And so uh, Pat Casey was great, and, and uh, he had, he had uh, known um, Jonathan a bit, as, as had, had Tink at Montana. So uh, that was where I started. And in, in terms of uh, advice along the way, really just making sure that as we move forward um, and develop that profile, we understood uh, how this place was special, that, that Glenn, as he organized uh, – um, our, our uh, month or so that, that he understood this place uh, as well. And, you know, Pat, Pat has a lot of intangibles. He, he, uh, he is a model program, and he's a model leader for that program. And so there's always something you'll learn from Pat Casey when you sit down with him. Jonathan, Ronald Clark from KZI9 News. Um, you talked about recruiting incoming students, but – Obviously, your recruiting starts here with these players now. What are you going to – what's kind of your pitch to the players who are here that are eligible for the NFL draft to be familiar with? Right. Well, first, I got to, you know, get to know them a little bit more before I get any kind of detailed uh, conversations with that. They're definitely going to be – we're going to re-recruit the kids that are seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen, and then incoming freshmen. <coughs> we're going to be recruiting them all, getting to know them all. And so, again, I go back to need to establish some trust between the both parties needs to take place. And so we're going to make efforts to, to get that started very, very quickly. Hey, Jonathan, Eric Patterson, KGW. Um, obviously, you're very passionate about this school and uh, probably feel very fortunate that with this crazy chess game going on with all these positions, all these names flying around, what do you make of all this craziness right now? 
Yeah, yeah, it's definitely been crazy. I just know that uh, timing's never perfect, but sometimes it, it it is, and it was really perfect for me, for sure. When this is your first time as a head coach, do you envision being the play caller, or do you envision handing those duties to whoever your offensive coordinator ends up being? Right. At this point, no, I do not be, uh, envision being the play caller. I do, uh, I do see myself being a little involved offensively. I've got a background. I've been doing it the last four years in this league. I've been doing it for a long time. So I'm going to have some uh, contributions to it, but I do not see myself calling the plays. Two more. You mentioned, obviously, Mike Riley and Dennis Erickson. Do you env what, envision, what role do you envision either of them having either with your staff or consulting or any capacity with the program? Yeah, I haven't got that far with those guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did talk to talk to Dennis a couple of days ago, and we started reminiscing. How about we used to just yell at each other from one the sideline to the huddle? And I don't know if that's going to work anymore. <laughs> yeah. And Scott, do you know at this point, as far as the salary pool for assistance, if it will be similar, more or less, compared to what it was <coughs> with this, this past year? Thanks for the question, Danny. So you think about what what needs to improve first the leader and we we got uh, without a shadow of a doubt the right leader so now you put the resource ar around that leader to be successful and that includes as we think about and we, we've done um, over the last several months gap analysis understanding where we sit against our uh, our peers in the pac-12 and beyond and salary pool for assistant coaches is a big deal we are going to make a mighty investment in in increasing the salary pool for assistant coaches and uh, one that enables Jonathan to get exactly who he wants. Scott, you mentioned at the uh, beginning during your opening statement that you had a, a plethora of free advice from fans <laughs> via social media. Um, with Considering the situation with Tennessee recently, Twitter has kind of become a firestorm now during coaching searches. How aware were you of social media after the Tennessee story broke out? You know, it's a, it's the question of the day, isn't it? And it really tends to you tend to think about what happened there and how that might reshape uh, uh, searches and, and and where we go. Certainly aware, you couldn't help to be aware of that circumstance. You know, unfortunately, as we went through the process, uh, our prescribed uh, game plan was uh, for the most part good. And you think about searches and how dynamic and fluid they are. We were we were pretty disciplined in, in where we went. The, one of the challenges for us, quite frankly, uh, some of the media outlets uh, that, that had erroneous uh, information early, particularly, we had to, we had to continue to count conversation with, with uh, and I, there's a difference between uh, um, reporting something and, and uh, suggesting something. I'm not talking about the suggestions at all. That's part of what we do. But when something's reported, now we've got to go back to all our candidates and say not true and, and put those fires out. That was... That was uh, and continues to be in the landscape of searches a uh, real challenge. My way of dealing with complaints was to refer them to Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, he did. <laughs> uh, Scott and, and Coach, actually, uh, I know you guys mentioned the, the coaching search and how you're still on that, but where does Corey Hall fit into this equation? Will he get the opportunity uh, to be part of your staff? So, so I, obviously that's going to be, as an athletic director, that'll be uh, the one thing I want to make sure our, our new coaches have is complete autonomy. We've hired them uh, in an incredibly important leadership position, and, and by doing so, we trust in their decision-making. And so uh, that'll, that opportunity will be uh, Jonathan's to, to figure out. I will say, as Jonathan said earlier, I can't thank Corey enough for – uh, stepping in the middle of a very unique and difficult situation, and and doing so well, and, and caring so much about our student athletes, and we had a we had that conversation again last night. So, yeah, adding to that, I would I again agree with what what Corey did for this place the last six eight weeks was phenomenal in a very difficult situation. I look forward to speaking with him, but no decisions have been have been made. Jonathan, I can appreciate. <clears throat> you know, you're an alum, you love this school, you love this place, and you had a lot of success here. But this is a really hard job now. A lot of people think it's one of the toughest jobs in America. The landscape of the Pac-12 has changed a lot since you played. But you seem really convinced that you can win here. Why is that? 
Well, I've been in this league the last four years, and I've seen how competitive this league is in week in and week out. You know, the landscape has changed. Facilities begin to change, but it's real. The, the players that are recruited to this side of the this side of the country are very similar. I see the schools, we travel to them when we played road games, I see it as very similar. And so I think it's a very competitive league and I think each school is pretty competitive with amongst each other. You see swings all the time in this league if you go over stretches of five to 10 years and I'm, I'm very confident this place can have another swing and we're gonna head up. Jonathan, Chantel Jennings, the All-American. You've had a chance to work really closely with Chris Peterson the last six years. He's a guy who, um, from a media standpoint, is really good at keeping people at a distance a little bit, so we don't get a chance to know a lot about him in his day-to-day. -day. But for you, what do you take most from him in terms of running a program and a team? Yeah, I think he's elite, again, at, at setting a direction and a vision for a program. I go back to, again, creating an elite culture is the starting point, and he does that. He works at it day in and day out as something for sure that we will bring here in regards to the culture that's created, not just on the field either, but off the field and the expectations and the standards that kids are held to under his, his leadership. I mean, I could go on and on about the guy because again, six years with him, but uh, for sure the, he c creates a clear direction for everybody. He, everyone's headed in the right, uh, same direction. And then he works at his culture very hard. <coughs> Nick Cuffey from Fox 12. She's not here now. I think the MVP though, the president's been your wife. Yeah, anyway. Was it working with those? Yeah. How much uh, has she helped been a backbone to you in the move from Idaho to Montana, both the yeah. Seattle back and forth? Yeah, she has been on board on all the moves. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we got married and she had been living in Southern California her whole life and came up to Corvallis and then really fell in love with this place and really started to fall in love with the Northwest. And yeah, we, we have circled the Northwest in all our moves. And now we're back to square one, which is exactly where we want to be. She does a great job with these kids. And, th and yet this job slash any coaching job nowadays, you got to have an elite wife, partner <laughs> along you with you. And I definitely got an elite one. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, Gary Horowitz with the Statesman Journal. Welcome back. I, I know you were here when this became an elite program and you've only met briefly with the players. But a lot of them were pretty down late in the year. Do you believe that it's going to take a while to get them to believe that the program can be something like it was a long time ago. You know, I, it's tough for me to forecast how they'll how they'll respond because I don't know them that well. I do uh, I do know that we're going to work hard and and battle each day. And again, the push to continue to trust each, each other, establish trust amongst the players and coaches, and and again hold each other on both ends accountable. I think it can move very fast. Jonathan Kerry Eggers, Portland Tribune. Um, Fifteen years ago, the facilities were much different than they are today. How good are they here? What needs to be done? What do you think are the priorities facility-wise to help you win? Well, I think they're really good here. And you know, and I, we talked about this through the, the process and the interviews and things, and the day-to-day the -day aspect for the student athlete here, I think is awesome. This place is first class. You've got a short distance to two awesome practice fields. The weight room is state-of-the-art and it's right there. The indoor, you go to some other places, you gotta travel amongst, you know, to get to different spots, you know, to the indoor facility, what are the weight room? The other piece I think is a huge advantage that we're amongst the campus right here. We're not removed, we're not distance. And I think that's a part of the culture of the student, not just the student athlete, but getting around the students, it's easy accessible around here. So I think it's really good. We're gonna always gonna push forward. Listen to the Scott's vision when I talked to him that over the last month, that is, uh, has been fun to hear about. And this guy's a visionary and he puts his hard hat on and works and he's put on continued results. Uh, Matt Rockwell, uh, Barstool Beavs, Barstool Sports. Um, oh, yeah. What's your plan to bring back that 2001 Fiesta Bowl team swagger back? Yeah, yeah. Well, I say we did. It definitely had some swagger, but I think we had 20 some odd penalties in that Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not trying to bring that kind of swagger back. Uh, Understandable. Yeah, I did hear from a bunch of those guys though, and I get. I go back to the memories made with them, and we had some some characters and, <laughs> and a bunch of fun and a bunch of competitive kids. And so we're going we're gonna to get back to being around some characters, but guys in a, a very, very good way. Uh, so Jonathan and Scott, can you guys, Jonathan, you just kind of mentioned Scott's vision. Can you guys both just kind of elaborate just briefly on that and what you mean by kind of that vision that you guys kind of talked about during the process? Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, when we think again about uh, all that we have to do, we're, we're going to do it in a strategic way. And so 
Uh, we have, in addition to comprehensive strategic plan to work on, we have a facilities master plan that that process launched, launched uh, a month or so ago and will be completed in, in the summer. And, and the, the primary goals of that facilities master plan process is one, a, a vision for the next 10 years uh, in each of our sports, um, and, and then a deep dive on priority projects that will ultimately uh, turn into to real projects. And, and that includes, as you think about the rising tide that lifts all boats, football, that includes uh, uh, jumping into it immediately in terms of what the needs are. Certainly, the west side is one of those, uh, a, punch, a potential refresh of, of the uh, strength and conditioning center and, and other needs. But uh, we, we love uh, the progress that's been made. Uh, this building uh, sets us apart in some ways. Uh, Jonathan's alluded to some of the other areas. But there's always a next step, and we will plan for that next step. We are actually planning for that next step right now. Bob Lundeberg, Corvallis Gazette Times. Uh, Jonathan, who are some of those uh, former Oregon State teammates that have reached out to you over the last 24 hours, and, and what have those yeah. messages been? Yeah, well, I could pull my – I was showing these guys. I could pull my <laughs> phone out. I got over 200 text messages right now. <laughs> now, they're not all from former players and whatnot, uh, but I, Ken Simonton, T.J. Hushmanzada, Marty Maurer, Chris Gibson, Bill Swancutt, Derek Anderson, Stephen Jackson, uh, and I could continue on, but it, it, uh, those guys are special to me, man. You know, and we've, we, we had some special times, but there's a, there's a short list to get you started. Coach, how important is it to have that Beaver culture coming back together with you coming as the head coach again? Yeah, I think it's really important. And, it, you know, again, starting with some of the former players here, because we've had some really good players go on and not just leave this place, but go on to the NFL and do some really good things. Um, and it's not just about the guys that went on to the NFL. We've had some really good guys go on in the business world and have some great success. And so I think it's vital to bring those guys back and continue to educate our current guys that it's beyond football. It's beyond just trying to get to the NFL. And here's a bunch of guys that have come here to Corvallis and gotten this done and are, are living big time lives, whether it's on or off the field. You mentioned having a recruiting base in Southern California. Where else do you envision going on from a national standpoint, whether Texas or Florida or, right. or, or different aspects? I of that? see the recruiting footprint of the, uh, for us is in the conference, in the states of the conference of the West Coast, when, uh, going over to Hawaii continually for sure. I think that uh, Texas is not too far, but at the same time, you start continue to fly over states where there's a bunch of kids you're flying over to get there. And so I'm not here to say that we are not going to recruit outside of the Pac-12 footprint, but we are definitely going to start there in that footprint. And then we will start more by car than by plane because we're going to be got car in this state, in the Northwest, and get ourselves into California and then continue to expand out from there. Uh, Jonathan, Mike Riley told me a story one time about the first time you guys ever met. You know, you told him you wanted to be a college coach, and so I'm sure that in the time, the whole time you've had a relationship with him and with Erickson, you've picked their brains about what it takes to be successful. What have both of them told you about what it takes to win here? Well, I, they've both, you know, lean on the experience that I had here and lean on what it took in regards to the type of players, the type of coaches, the type of culture that, that was here and was established and lean on those experiences to draw you forward in, in what takes place now. Both those guys have been awesome and, and supportive. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll continue to stay in touch with those guys as it, it goes along, but both of them have been really encouraging to, to remember the days. Thank you. That'll work.